let's just go on into the parlor. Please come in. The parlor of an old house is the equivalent of the reception room today. Guests coming in were brought here and um, in this particular parlor many weddings were performed because the home of the minister was a frequent place to have weddings. Many people back in the late 1800s could not have weddings in their homes for various reasons and they could not afford to have them at church for various reasons so they came to the home of the minister. The most famous of those was the wedding of the man we call O. Henry, William Sidney Porter and his bride Ethel Estes. All of these people whose weddings were performed here by Dr. Smoot, who was a Presbyterian minister, stood in front of the fireplace and um, the uh, rites of the service were observed at this place. However, uh, that is another full story and so we'll come back to the objects in this room. About the furnishings, most of the furniture in the house was brought here from the old homes of the uh, Smoot and Graham families back in Bowling Green, Kentucky and Huntington, Tennessee. Also, <clears throat> it's interesting to notice that in those days, young couples getting married did not go out and buy brand new furniture, but uh, they were given remnants, old things, by their families. In this room, there are two complete different sets of furnishings. Uh, if you're close up, you can see which pieces match in design and uh, therefore know that two different branches of the family contributed to the accumulation in this room. There are other things here that are interesting. My father, Lawrence Kelly Smoot, although he was of a career in law, an attorney with the Supreme Court for 66 years, he loved to work with his hands and he did that artistically as well as in a utilitarian sense. Uh, for example, on this table is a Mississippi River boat which he made all by himself on what he called the scroll saw that we still have in the kitchen. Nowadays I think it would likely be called a jigsaw. Anyway, <clears throat> he designed this river boat, cut it out meticulously and painstakingly uh, on the scroll saw and gave it to his mother as a present. The picture, the round picture, shows him at the age when he made this uh, river boat. Down below, you can see he even worked in a design showing the fish in the river underneath the river boat. He made many other objects on the scroll saw. Here, for example, is an easel, uh, which we do not use as an easel. We just use it as a decorative piece but he made a good many of these easels uh, with a crossbar he had down here and gave those as presents to people. But each one represented many hours of hard work. Also on this table, down on the lower level, you have his graphophone. Graphophone, sometimes called gramophone, we would say record player. This is one of the first ones that came to Austin the kind that has the wax cylinders, you know. And can you see the little dog just to the left? Nipper, I believe his name was. And uh, that was a famous trademark of that advertisement of that early day gramophone. Uh, my father was very popular at all the parties because everybody wanted his graphophone or gramophone to come to the party. He had many of the wax cylinder recordings. <coughs> Here on the fireplace, we have another evidence of early day artistry and craftsmanship. Uh, these vases with the portraits on them were made by an itinerant photographer of those days. Uh, the, the method he used, the procedure he used, uh, probably today would be very familiar and 
considered very simple. But in those days, uh, that procedure was considered pure magic. Anyway, these vases were presented to my grandparents as a Christmas present by the family of Mr. Brush, uh, who was an early uh, day member of Austin society. His descendants still live here in Austin. And Mr. Brush asked my father to give to him a picture, a real photograph, of both of my grandparents, uh, promising to get them back safely and uh, by Christmas. And he did. He brought the photographs back untouched, unblemished, and yet the same photograph is reproduced on the vases. I know of one other of these still in Austin. There used to be a good many. I don't know what became of all the others. The fireplace was originally built for wood, and it was a large opening for wood cords and uh, wood logs. But along in the 1890s, it became fashionable to use coal, and even more fashionable not to have a wooden mantelpiece. The mantelpiece was wood hand carved. So the folks gave way to fashion and took out the old wooden mantelpiece and brought in this iron reproduction, this iron uh, simulation of marble. Marble was the popular thing, but my folks couldn't afford, afford marble, so they had this iron painted to look like marble. I used to be ashamed of that because I thought of it as a sort of a, a cheap um, substitute. And I thought of it as uh, an, an awkward, fake thing, which I didn't like. I wanted the real thing. But anyway, I found out since that there are special antique dealers uh, who like special um, iron simulations of marble. They go in for that as an extra interest. So I think a little bit more of it now that I know some people favor it as a specialty. In this corner of the room, we have a piece of furniture which has a story behind it. <clears throat> the small uh, desk, the low desk, was used by my father to get his lessons when he was a little boy. And that was all there was to it, just this little table desk. However, <clears throat> somewhere in the cellar or other storage, there were these four shelves, just the shelves, which had holes in the corners. And the shelves were connected by rope, a smooth rope and joined at the top with a kind of V-shaped uh, cone which held them together. Now the purpose of these shelves was for my great-grandfather Graham, who was uh, a journey judge, to carry them in his suitcase, collapsed of course, and then he had his law book stacked on top of them in the suitcase so that when he went to a new city to hold court, he could just open the suitcase, take out the shelves, string them up, hang them on the wall, put his books on the shelves, and he would be in business as a judge. Well, the shelves had come along here with the family, <clears throat> but they had no use for them. So my father decided to have these legs made, these columns, to support the shelves, which he then added on top of his little school desk and made this whatnot. I know there are other words for such pieces of furniture nowadays, but <clears throat> the old-fashioned word is whatnot. And he, we have here another piece of his handiwork on the scroll saw. This is a handkerchief box. And uh, you remember the, uh, the uh, piece we showed you over there. And here is another one of the easels on this table. Uh, plus the <clears throat> more modern editions of the Hummel figurines. Let's move on now across the room. This whatnot in the corner of the room behind the door has all sorts of interesting things on it. Many family treasures that I won't stop to talk about but two which I've taken off the shelf to show close up. 
here a centipede that was found in the uh, location where the house was being built at the time it was being built and that was 1877 you remember so this centipede is of some age. Also this flower the night blooming Sirius was blooming in about 1890 here on the place. My grandmother uh, Mrs. Sally uh, Graham Smoot had this flower quite a large one and it bloomed riotously, was very heavily perfumed, quite a marvelous uh, object. Anyway, one of the uh, pharmacists in town told her that if she would send one while it was blooming to him, he would preserve it in alcohol in a fruit jar. It bloomed only between midnight and dawn. So my, grand my father was commissioned on his bicycle about two o'clock in the morning to take this blossom down to the pharmacist uh, who then put it into this jar. And both pieces have been in their jars ever since. Uh, they are slowly fading away, but you can see them before they're entirely gone. Also on this whatnot, please notice on the top shelf the seashells. It was customary in those days for members of the church when traveling to bring back souvenirs to the minister and his wife. At that time, seashells were very popular. They were quite a fad. Where these came from, precisely, I'm not sure. I'd like to know. But they were brought by members of the church to the family. The two on the end still have the roar of the sea in them if you put them to your ear. Every door in the house has something behind it, and on the wall, just next to the whatnot, uh, you see two pictures, photographs, actual photographs of the front of this house at the time it was built, or shortly thereafter, I suppose. A pretty good snowstorm, too. Notice the difference in the front porch. I did mention when we were out there that uh, it was a simple frame porch with uh, simple pillars, posts, instead of the columns, you see. Uh, every door in the house, except maybe one, has something interesting behind it. So as you tour the house, uh, be sure to notice behind the doors, and you will find something surprising and something interesting.